Okay, so we are going to start today. This is our introductory lesson, and so it's the introduction to the book. Now, if, if we were writing this as a book or, or had a book in front of us, this would be introduction, which I understand 73% of people don't read the introductions to books. So you're having to sit through something that the odds are you would not read. Now, I'm using that statistic uh, in the sense that 38% of statistics are made up on the spot. And uh, I don't really have any clue what the statistic is, but I know that a lot of people don't read them. So I hope you'll endure the introduction to this. Next week, we start out with what I think should be chapter one in the book. Uh, so this is the introduction, and I hope you're here. Now, if we were around in Egypt, oh, let's go back for, no, 5,000 years they had a vision of what they thought the gods looked like. And they had different visions for different gods, and they'd make statues out of some of them, and massive monuments out of others, and, and paintings out of yet others. But I don't want to go back to there and ask what they envision with God. I want to ask you. I want you to answer this question for me. If you were to close your eyes and try to envision God, what would God look like? If you just try and think, okay, what does God look like? Now, whatever the vision is, if you've got one, and if you don't, that's okay. I want you to hold on to it while I walk through the class this morning. I am convinced that we have a vision of God that is too small. I'm convinced that as a result of our vision of God being too small, our unbelief in God tends to grow. And there's this part of us that doubts who God is and what God has done. If I were to take a poll and I were to ask you in your heart of hearts, do you believe that God truly became a human being? That God truly, as Jesus, died? And that there was a physical resurrection where if we had been at the tomb on Easter morning, we could have physically seen a physically brought back to life Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you that question, I would not be surprised to see your belief almost scale in accordance with your age. And the older people will more likely believe it than the younger people. And I think one of the reasons why is because the younger people are living with a, a world and a reality that dictates a different view of God. The stunning part for me is the view of God that is necessary is found in the Bible. And the God that we envision that seems too small to answer our intellectual problems, that seem too small to answer the existential problems, that seems too small to answer the day-to-day -day issues we have, that God is not the biblical God. That God is too small. Now, I, I'm talking about this. Hello, Chloe. I was talking about this, sorry, sidetracked. Saw Gary Greer and his daughter sitting over there, and I hadn't seen Chloe in a while, so I was saying, hi, Chloe. Um, now I'm going to have to call you all out by name, aren't I? <laughs> there was a, a, an Anglican clergyman who produced a really good translation of the New Testament, I might add, called uh, uh, 
the Phillips translation. His name was J.B. Phillips. And in 1952, J.B. Phillips wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. Now that's a book that I've treasured for as far back as I can remember. Since I, I, well, at least back to high school, I should say. And here's what he did. In 1952, J.B. Phillips lived in a world that was very different than the world of his parents. J.B. Phillips lived and ministered in a world where the atrocities of World War II were only then beginning to unfold. The pictures were finally coming out over the last five to six years of the concentration camps. Photographs so gruesome I didn't put them in the PowerPoint. Massive graves from the atrocities of World War II. A time where in, in Germany there was a film that Hitler had made as propaganda in the 30s that was shown to all of the, of the youth of Germany, required as the youth joined Hitler's youth. And at that formative age, pledged their lives to whatever their Fuhrer wanted. And the atrocities that that brought about turned the world upside down as people were aware of an evil that can exist. And people began to ask the questions, where is God in this? Or how about the, the picture that Pastor David had in his PowerPoint this morning. That was a picture of the explosion of the first atomic bomb in 1945. And once that atom was split and that power unleashed, it turned the world upside down. No longer was war just a, a, a time of trenches and tanks. But now there were bombs that could truly annihilate humanity. And so into this world comes an Anglican preacher who realizes that a lot of people aren't going to church because they don't see value in it. And a lot of people that are going to church are going through the motions and then there are those that are just blithely going on, unaware that these other groups even seem to exist. And he said, the people are missing a God that's big enough for the modern world. And that's why he wrote this book. And, and it's a great book. And it's well worth reading if you haven't. But what I want to do in the introduction is kind of summarize the book. Because we're not going to rehash his book in this class. See, we live not in 1952. We live in 2012. And if we turn the clock forward the next 60 years, we've put man on the moon. We've unraveled the DNA code that makes our bodies what they are. We have computers and tablets, iPads. We have Phones that do remarkable things. And in 1952, those people were missing a God big enough for their modern world. I'm convinced today we're still missing a God big enough for our modern world, even if we take advantage of his book and read it. Because his book was great in his time, but to quote Bob Dylan, the times they are a changing. And I think God, in the minds of many people, is still too small. You see, that's the problem. How do you get the God in your mind and start really thinking that that is God? God's not a creature of your mind. God is. And the goal for us is to get our minds to understand who He is. And don't ever be under the illusion that he is what we have in our mind. As if the gray cells in these two fists, that's how big your mind is. You can make two fists. Those are a bunch of gray cells. Do you honestly think 
that a collection of gray cells like this are going to grasp the intricacies of God Almighty. So all of us need some help along the way. And that's what we're going to do. We'll today review his book. This is a book report. I'm going to stand up and give you my book report. J.B. Phillips, your God is too small. And then over the next few weeks, I've got eight lessons that I've, I've outlined at this point where we're going to delve into all sorts of modern issues and see how they, they, they reflect upon God and what they tell us about God and what that means in our lives. I want to blow the doors open on our mind of who God is. Because we need God for who he is. And an inadequate God will not make it through these times. You'll either leave your faith or your faith will be relatively useless. So let's look at it. Your God is too small. When Phillips wrote this, he divided it into two different parts. In the first part, which is the main part, he went about trying to deconstruct bad views of God or views of God that are too small. And he said, here are these views of God. These are too small. So let's just take them and dismantle them. And then during the second part of the book, he says, now let's reconstruct a more adequate view of God. And I like that method. And you'll notice at the top of the current publication of this book, this little print that says, it's a guide for believers and skeptics alike. And it is. Because believers can better appreciate their God and their faith. And so many people who are skeptics about God, if you're sitting there saying, I'm cynical about whether or not there really is such a God, then let me suggest to you, this is a series for you. Because the God who is, is the only God that truly explains the way the world is, the way you and I are, what functions, and all of these grandiose things that are out there. So believers and skeptics alike come. If you've got friends, bring them to the class. This isn't an embarrassing class. This isn't a class where you're going to walk away, and I hope, and say, oh, that was so awkward. This is a class that ought to be welcome for everybody if they have a brain. If they don't have a brain, bring them anyway. <clears throat> What I'd like to do right now, though, is I want to take the 17 ideas of God that Phillips had, and I want to put them out in front of you one by one. And these are all ideas of God that J.B. Phillips said is a God who is too small. Now, some of his labels don't fit well. I had trouble finding some pictures for some of them. So we'll do the best we can. But uh, um, uh, we'll need to interpret some of it because even his writing 60 years later in a continent away is, is hard to, to just pick up in some way. So let's go through it, can we? As we do it, would you ask yourself, I wonder if some of that's me. I wonder if I see God that way. Because I want to tell you, some of these are me. Some of these are the struggles I have where I've limited God. And I want to know if, I mean, this, and just see if any of this is where you sit there and say, you know, I think, I think that's kind of me. I got to tell you a side point. You know, I send these lessons out to 75 or so scholars on Friday night and, and people, and I say, give me any comments. One of the scholars who just consistently, he's an Old Testament professor, he always writes all these tremendous comments on my lessons. He gives me this great input, this great, you know, what about this, what about this? He's, I'm reading his comments on this lesson. And he says, man, you nailed me on this one. That's me. But when I read it, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I got to fix that. That can't be right. Why do I hold that view? So see if any of these are used. First, God is the resident policeman. God is this voice in your head. He's the cop that dwells in your mind. He's your conscience. He's that 
conscience voice that says, oh, tisk, tisk, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Mistake. Or he's that, that confirmation of, you know, the, the, you got the two little angels on your, he's the good angel. Who's telling you what to do? And J.B. Phillips says, if you think God is your conscience, then your God is way too small, and I agree with J.B. Phillips. That's not to say that your conscience is not a moral force that you have in your mind. Paul talks about the importance of not violating your conscience. But don't ever equate your conscience with God. Your conscience is affected by how you were brought up, by where you live, by your culture, by what you value. There are people whose consciences were not bothered at all by doing some horrible things in World War II. And yet, those things were wrong. God is not your conscience. God, Paul says in Romans, is set about to renew your mind because your conscience needs purification. There are things your conscience will approve that you have no right doing. There are things your conscience will disapprove that are actually okay. I was brought up in a church that did not have instrumental music and taught that it was wrong as part of worship. And there was a time in my life where I studied that issue and I reached a point where I thought, okay, I was wrong. It's okay to have instruments in worship. But I got to tell you, it was a year or two before my conscience really let me live it even though my mind believed it. Because I'd just been brought up thinking, this is wrong. Your conscience is not God. It's not. And if you think God, if you equate God with your conscience, then you're going to be let down because your God is too small. Second, the parental hangover. Here the idea is, is that God is that father figure. And you're sitting there saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus calls him our Father. He taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. He says, if your Father who is in heaven. And in 1 John, we're told we're the children of the Father. All of that's true. But we should never think of God as our earthly Father in those terms. Because that's not what it's about. Some people have harsh and angry and terrible earthly fathers. And they are in danger of thinking that God is unapproachable. I would never go to my father with this or that. I thank the Lord I did not have such a father. I had a very kind father and a very loving father who did exemplify so many traits of God, but my father was not perfect. And we've got to be very, very careful about that. So if you had a terrible father, don't let that terrible father affect your view of God. God is a father in an eternal sense of he cares, he nurtures, he loves, he disciplines, but he is there to, to eternally be your father. Now, here's another place, though. Philip says it's not only that some people think had a harsh father, and so that makes God unapproachable, but another problem is some people don't ever want to be more than a spiritual baby. And they love the idea of having a father in the sense that they can just go back, as the psychologists say, there is a strain of psychology that says the religious person is just looking to be a child again. I had a 72-year-old woman come into my office recently. And she was having a massive problem. And she didn't know what to do about it. And in tears as she sat opposite me, she said, I'm 72, my dad's been dead for decades, but all I want to do right now is crawl in his lap and have him tell me everything is okay. 
we've got to be real careful if we take God to be simply that entity that allows us to be a child. Now you're sitting there saying, wait, Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you don't enter the kingdom. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about as a child, you, you're, you're able to, to more readily have faith. As a child, you're able to be less cynical. As a child, you're able to be less uh, self-indulgent. As a child, you're able to be uh, more dependent. And it's important to be dependent upon God. But God's not looking for us to romp around in spiritual diapers. He wants us to grow. As a father, he wants to nurture us into spiritual adulthood. There is a vicious world out there that will not just rain on your parade, it will throw you down and stomp on you. It will knife you in the back, it will do all sorts of horrible things. And God wants you to grow up so that you can handle it. Jesus didn't tell his apostles, hey, come, stay with me, and let's enclose ourselves in this little cocoon and let the world go by. He said, you go out there and you'll get persecuted and you'll get abused and people will make fun of you and people will laugh at you. But you go out there in my name and know that you're blessed when you're persecuted. That's what the Bible, Paul didn't, I, Paul's life was not easy street. So we got to watch that view. Next view, the grand old man. Now think about it this way. How many of you used to be a child? Okay, most of you. Um, and I, trust me, I think you all were. It's just for some of us, it's been so long, we don't remember it. But we were, okay? We were. Um, and we learn of God when we're a child. And so God's always older. And then as we get older, God's that old guy. And what do we know about old people? They don't really get it, do they? Someone down here said, yes, they do. And that person is not young. But that's because that person realizes that that person gets it and young people don't realize that person gets it. But I'll bet when that person was young, that person would not have said the old people get it. Okay? Sometimes we think of God as some old man because he's been around forever and because we knew him as a child. We heard about him at least. And so he's some old guy. And yet, that's like the ultimate generation gap. How can he handle the stuff we've got going on now? He just, bless his heart. Can you hear me? While he's rocking in his chair. Pointing out, hey, can't let them do that. They'll have too much fun. Don't think of God as some grand old man. Don't get me wrong. He is the ancient of days. But there's not a lick of science that exists today that he didn't write into the DNA and structure of our nature. Our God is contemporary. Our God makes contemporary look old. He's not some grand old man who's out of energy, just on his last legs, saving just enough back to come again. He's, he's there. And we got to get that old concept of God out of our brain. The meek and mild God. Now, Scripture says, blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. And Jesus can be meek. But Scripture doesn't say he was mild. That word, I think Phillips is right. Phillips says we have Jesus as meek and mild because it really fit well in a song. We needed to rhyme something with child. And if it started with an M, it fit well with meek. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Now, 
I, I love some of Wesley's other hymns, so I'm not just throwing rocks at Charles Wesley's hymn writing. But gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child. Pity my simplicity, suffer me to come to thee. The problem, you know, I'm just sitting there, huh? Where did that come from? Jesus is the one who went into the, the temple and overturned the tables on the money changers. Jesus is the one who walks right through the village of people wanting to stone him and kill him. Jesus is the one who will go face to face with the scribes and the Pharisees and the rulers. And he has zero problem telling them where to get off when they're offending the Lord. Jesus, meek and mild. And so we grow up with this idea, some, of God being some, oh, just some nice little meek and mild Casper milk toast. And then as we get older, we look back on that vision and we think, gee, God works real well for children, but this is the real world. And a Jesus meek and mild won't fit. But it's not biblical. Next, absolute perfection. Now you might read this, and this is where some of the dating comes in. You say, but, but God is absolutely perfect. Yes, he is. Hear me. God is absolute perfection. That's not what J.B. Phillips meant. J.B. Phillips meant that there are some people who believe God requires absolute perfection of us. That he's a God who will not be satisfied unless each one of us are doing exactly to the letter what he wants. He said the problem with that is you got two choices. That either means that you're going to simplify the demands of God. You're going to make God's character and God's nature god light. you got Disney Jesus so that you can measure up. Or you're going to walk miserable all your life because you can't. And of course, the biblical image is that the absolute perfection God requires, none of us will ever meet. And that's why Jesus had to come. You don't need a Savior if you don't need saving. Heavenly bosom. There's a storm in life. By the way, thanks to my wife and Rachel daughter for doing all of our illustrations today. I was having trouble finding anything on the internet that quite fit the bill. So they were viciously drawing and coloring around the breakfast table this morning. Heavenly bosom. Here's the idea. There's a storm raging. Life is miserable. People are mean. The economy stinks. We can't make a go of it. Our culture's going down the tubes. I don't like the people I work with. My family is in disarray. What am I going to do about my children? What am I going to do about my spouse? What am I going to do about my parents? Oh, I just need to go to Jesus and just lay down in his arms and let him hold me. And then when the coast is clear, I'll come back to earth. Phillips says, and I got to tell you, this was one of these that really hits close to home for me. Phillips says, oh, please understand, there is a time and place to go to Jesus. He is your refuge. He is your fortress. He is your rock. But you go to Jesus so that he can equip you to go out and handle the storm. You're not running to escape from the storm. 
you're running to get empowered to endure the storm. If you look at, at uh, uh, the, the spiritual warfare weapons Paul talks about in Ephesians, to gird yourselves, nothing that he gives you protects your backside from arrows while you're running away from the conflict. Everything he gives you is frontal protection. Because we are in a war. This is not our home. This is not a, a place where everything is hunky-dory. And what God does is he equips us and he strengthens us for battle. And when you've got the conflict you don't like and you've got the problems you can't handle, yes, you go to the Lord. And Lord, I can't handle this. I need you to be my strength. I need you to be my fortress. I need you to be my refuge. I need you to be my defense. Now empower me to walk through this with you as my strength. It's a difference. God strengthens us for the storm. Next, God in a box. Okay, I did that drawing. Can you tell the difference between mine and Becky's? <laughs> Becky, me. Becky, me. <laughs> Becky, me. God in a box. Not as big of a problem of late as it used to be. But here is his point. There are a lot of churches that say God is uniquely at our church in our denomination. And you come in here and you can meet God. You don't come in here, you ain't going to meet him. Or you can go to that other church down the street with the rest of the satanic people. <sighs> but here is where God dwells. And if you think that, and I think that, not only is our God too small, but if we ever give that impression to people outside, they'll know that you're not, not going to convince them, oh, oh yeah, they've really cornered the market on God. God is only there. God is bigger than any denomination. Now, next, God's a managing director. This is the idea that God is up there and he's created this vast and incredible universe. It's very complicated. There are billions of people on this planet. And he's just kind of got it all going. But heaven forbid you think he has time for you. He's got a lot more important stuff going on than to care what you have for lunch. Why are you thanking him for it? He's got, I, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Bob and I kid about Dr. Bob growing up with this idea that he's got a certain limited number of prayers that God's going to hear. And he never wanted to waste one as a kid. He was saving them for just the right, you know, okay, this is worth one of my prayers. But it's like bullets in a gun. You only have so many and you don't want to shoot one. Because you may really need one later on and you may have run out. God is so busy, he can't be bothered by us. Well, God is never too lofty or too busy. That's a funny one too. That one almost makes you sound pious. Almost makes you sound, well, bless your heart. You may be praying a lot to God, but you've you got to understand God's too big for your prayers. He's so big, he doesn't know who you are. Okay, well, that's not making God so big. That's making God too small. Next, secondhand God. Ooh, listen to this one. Secondhand God. That's not the thing where you get the God that your parents had and they just hand it down. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what do we think about God by the fact that we read these books like... Uh, Fiction by Have No Clue. What, what, does, what does it mean? You see, what happens is you'll have books that'll have an entire character development and life to them, an entire plot to them. And for us now, you know he wrote this in 52, but for us now we see this also in TV shows especially. Uh, the average person under the age of 25 watches 35 movies for every book they read which I find scary, but be it as it may. You'll find this in different places where you'll have characters developed. You'll have really nice people. You'll have friends who can sleep around 
and never have a moment of guilt. You'll have evil people who do wicked things and nothing bad ever seems to happen to them. Because this is a fiction world. It's not reality. There are people who are able to write this stuff and some of them can do it and totally ignore God. And you can watch the TV show and you can see these people doing these things. And it's, uh, there's no mention of God. There's no reference to God. God doesn't exist. It's as if you can have all of the joys of life or all of the miseries of life or all of the problems of life and exist all the time with no God and come out smelling like a rose generally within 30 minutes. And that's fiction. Don't get your impression of who God is by reading the books or watching the TV shows. Some of them mock God. They only put God in it when they're taking, making fun of the abusive priest or the idiot who just thinks everything's wonderful because they don't know any better. Bless their heart. And some actually become God in the way they write. And they let circumstances and things manipulate in such a way where they're able to create this world. And it's as if it explains the way our world is without God. Fate seems to hold the keys. Don't let your image of God and your understanding of God be formed by someone else who writes fiction for a living. Next, perennial grievance. These are the people who find in God an extreme disappointment. Oh God, why will I ever trust him again? I prayed and he did not answer. I asked him for healing for someone dear to me and they passed away. Ergo, I have a grievance against God. God doesn't answer prayer. God is in the disappointment business. I sang a song in church today, call out your name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When I say your name, something special happens, but nothing special happened that I needed. How disappointing is God? And I, I pulled the quote out of Phillips because I really like this quote. He said, people are wanting a world in which good is rewarded and evil punished, as in a well-run kindergarten. The problem is, we live in a world where God has allowed free will to work. Did you know, if you want to do something wicked, you can? If you want to do something wrong, you can. If you want to violate God, you can. If you want to say, oh God, uh, I don't care what you say, I'm going to go left when you say go right. You can do that. And you can cause pain and misery to other people. Because it is a free will world that somehow God manages to work through in a way to bring to fruition his plan. But the promise from God is not that everything's fair and right and just and every prayer gets answered according to your agenda or mine. The promise to God from God is, is that according to his agenda and in his timing things work out. And if we think that God's got to adjust to our agenda, then our vision of God is too small. If we have a vision of God for how great he is, we will on our knees pray, Lord, adjust me to your agenda. Next. Okay, this one we totally miss. Jesus as a pale Galilean. Where does he get that label? I actually had to research to find it. He just said, as Swinburne the poet said, Thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean, the world is grown gray from thy breath. I thought, well, okay, I'd never read Swinburne poetry that I remember, so I have no clue what that means. I had to go back and read Swinburne. And I mean, it was a pretty good poem. It's a Roman lamenting 
the fall of classical Rome because Christianity has now come in. And it is so dull and so boring. The world has grown gray from thy breath. Jesus, the boring one. I think if we were to put this into modern terms, something at least in my generation would have relate to is this is the idea that Jesus is truly what Billy Joel says. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than die with the saints. The sinners have much more fun. Only the good die young. It's the same mentality. Ugh, the Christians. I challenge anybody to find that in the Bible. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Paul talks about a joy that the world doesn't understand, a peace that passes understanding. Do you honestly think Paul's life was boring? I mean, have you been to jail a bunch? Had a bunch of shipwrecks? Have you had an earthquake spring you from jail? Have you been able to raise anybody who fell from a window and died? Have you been able to raise them from the dead? Have you been besat upon by robbers and still gone out to do more? And this is not the world of boredom. If you think the world is boring as a Christian, then volunteer for vacation Bible school this week. <laughs> Next. God is a projected image. This is more of the psychology stuff. But there's this idea that we project the image of, of, the, of ourself or the image of our culture out, and we call that God. So you go back and read the sermons of the preachers during the Puritan time period, where they were very harsh and rule-oriented. And they preach about God as a very harsh and rule-oriented God. Or you find someone who's just nice and everything's lovey-dovey and gentle and laid back and they see God as nice and lovey-dovey and gentle I mean he's like Father Christmas Santa Claus and if we hold an image of God that's just a projection of who we are and what we value then all we're doing is worshiping ourselves we're not worshiping the God who is we're worshiping the God we envision. We're worshiping ourselves. That's not an adequate God. If God is our projected image and we're worshiping ourselves, then we don't... I mean, what we need to do as a church and as believers or as skeptics. If you're a skeptic out there, I don't know if God exists or not. Don't form your image and don't ask your questions based on what people tell you about God and based upon what you've learned through through osmosis, even if it's going to church, you form your image based upon how God has revealed himself through Scripture. And not one verse of Scripture. He didn't do it in one verse. He did it over a couple of thousand years of relationships with people, finally becoming flesh and himself manifesting the life of God as man in Jesus Christ, the final word. You want an image of God and you don't have time to read the Bible all cover to cover? Read the Gospel of John. And then read it again. I had a friend who was telling me, Mark, I don't know what to do. I want to read the Bible. I need God in my life. I don't know where God is. Can you tell me how to buy a Bible? I said, yeah, he uses a credit card or cash. He said, no, no, I mean, where do I get one? I said, we were out of town in trial at the time. I said, go to Walmart. When you buy one, buy one that's a modern kind of translation. Get something like the New International Version. And I said, and when you start reading it, don't start with Genesis 1-1. As Bob will tell you, Leviticus gets real dry. <laughs> Bob's told me many times when he's doing his read through the Bible, I'm still having trouble understanding why Leviticus is even in this thing anymore. 
but I told our friend, I said, uh, start with the Gospel of John and just read it and read it and read it. And he read it and he read it and he read it. What do I do now? Read it again. What do I do now? Read it again. He found Jesus there. Then he started reading Matthew, and he called me and said, okay, I'm going to hell. I'm really worried. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, before I couldn't commit adultery, now I can't even lust. Before I couldn't murder, now I can't even hate. He says, I'm going to hell. What should I do? I said, well, I won't be able to visit with you for another three days. He says, well, what do I do in the meantime? I said, quit reading Matthew and go back and read John. <laughs> God in a hurry. You know, there's a lot of people who just think God's got to have it and he's got to have it right now. I really liked Pastor Fleming's comments this morning about the margins. You know, there is a mentality of, wait a minute. Uh, it's, it's a dicey thing and I don't want to offend anybody here. But I do want to tell you that God's not in a hurry. He's got everything under control. And I'm not saying you go on vacation all the time. But don't have this frenetic pace. And don't confuse God with someone who's running out of time. And if you don't get there and you can't get everybody on that same page with you and you don't get out there and do it right now, God could be lost. God's not going to be lost. He's not going to be lost. Some confuse God as thinking God has different classes of believers. There are the just barely hanging on Christians. There are the normal Christians. Then there are the super spiritual who talk like this. No, God doesn't have classes. He's not a God of the elite. It's not, oh gee, we should all become monks so that God will really hear our prayers. If you want to know why Jesus said the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, it's because a righteous man understands God's heart and he's praying for God's will. It's not that, oh, God's going to listen to this prayer more because you're, 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 you're better. Don't get me wrong. The better you are, the more you align yourselves with the heart of God, the more you know how to pray God's will and what God wants. It's very important that we grow. But it's not that there are these different classes and God gives special treatment to the elite. Some, not so much today as back then, see God as the God of Bethel. He's only the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> I did that drawing. He's only the God of the Old Testament. And they don't understand that it took the entire Bible to unfold God's character in the ways he wants to reveal it. And, and they think he's the God of the Old Testament in the sense that there was this God in the Old Testament that seemed to be a contractual partner. If you do this, I will do this. That's Deuteronomy 28. If you will do this, I'll do this. If you don't, I'll do that. God's more than a contractual partner with us. And if we limit him to that, we've made God way too small. Now, for some people, there's God without a Godhead, as he called it. That's just, we take together all of the things that we think are noble and good and virtuous, and we put them all together, and God's just that to the nth degree. And that's wrong. God's not simply an ultimate bundle of the highest values. God is a being, a complex, complicated being. Not surprisingly, more complex and complicated than our brains will understand. And he has revealed himself to us in ways that help us understand him. But he's not simply, oh, just all the good things to an nth degree. Finally, God by any other name. Here's the point. If there's anything that you or I put greater value in than we do God, whether it's money, whether it's power, whether it's prestige, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a future, whether it's a job, anything that you and I place greater value in than God tells me that our God is too small. Because God is greater than anything else. 
we just have misplaced values and a misplaced understanding of who God is. So after deconstructing all of that, he constructs. And I just want one slide for the construction side of this. We're almost done. We're going to approach this a little bit differently than J.B. Phillips did. But I think his book's a good springboard for us. Here's what I want you to do. He asks you to do this sort of in his book. I'm taking, I want you to, if you want to close your eyes, close your eyes. If not, just keep your eyes open and look at the screen or something. But visualize beauty. Not something beautiful, but beauty. Visualize truth. Not something that is true, but the concept of truth. Visualize the concept of good. Not a good idea, not a good thing, not a good person, not a good deed. The idea of good. And you can't do it. Those aren't things you readily can identify in terms of visualizing. The interesting thing is, is God is beauty. God is truth. Not just he is a true thing and doesn't lie, but God is truth. God is good. Not just he does good. He is good. But you can't envision that and you can't envision God. Save for the fact that God says, I'm going to become a man and I'm going to show you what it is to be beautiful. Not in physical form. In fact, Scripture says he wasn't beautiful in physical form. But he was true beauty. What it means to be truth. What it means to be good. You can't visualize the concepts, but you can visualize the presence. And so what, what Phillips does, is, and he does so well, is he says, you know, the world the way it is, really only makes sense if we understand it the way God's revealed it. And that only makes sense if we understand God for how great he is. And so that's what he does with his book. Now here's my question for you for today and as we start to get into this over the next few weeks, months. Where is your understanding of God too small? In what ways do you envision God where your, your, your faith is challenged? In what ways do you envision God where your life seems unsatisfactory? In what ways do you envision God when you come to church to worship? Because those are the concepts that we're going to deal with. And we're going to deal with them in some fun ways. We're going to deal with them in terms of of, of the world as it is today. The social networking, the, the, the creativity. Uh, we're going to look at, at the stars and astrophysics. We're going to look at cellular biology. We're going to look at, at uh, uh, philosophy. We're going to look at the way the world is today, little by little, week by week, and try to not just deconstruct images of God that are inadequate, but try hand in hand at the same time to construct something that, that helps us better understand God in ways that changes our faith, brings us growth, sets us on a new path of worship, gives us strength in life, and grows us before the Lord. That's our goal. Would you pray with me? Lord, we commit this series to you. We know a lot of people will be traveling this summer and, and we uh, pause, Lord, from our Bible study to, to approach you in a different way. And we pray that you will still use the scriptures to enlighten us through this, Father. We pray your blessings on people that are traveling, but pray that you will have present here with us those people who need to grow each week in our understanding of you in the ways that we're dealing with. We thank you for your love. We're excited to know you better.
We pray through your revealed word, Jesus. Amen.